Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Thanks to scientific and technological discoveries, we know more, much more, about ourselves and the universe. Sir John Maddox has had a ringside seat for many of these discoveries, the editor of the distinguished British science journal, Nature. He is the author of a new book with a long subtitle, What Remains to be Discovered? Mapping the Secrets of the Universe, the Origins of Life, and the Future of the Human Race. He is joined today on Think Tank by Peter Brown of the New York Academy of Sciences and editor of The Sciences Magazine. The topic before the house is John Maddox's What Remains to be Discovered, this week on Think Tank. Science and Technology in the 20th Century. Einstein's theory of relativity and the nuclear bomb. Antibiotics, Watson and Crick's DNA molecule. Neil Armstrong's moonwalk. The cloning of mammals. Pathfinder's sojourn to Mars. Add Velcro and frozen yogurt and you have a staggering list. While revolutionary, the 20th century of science is by no means unique. The 17th century gave us Rene Descartes on geometry, Isaac Newton on gravity and mechanics, and Galileo and Kepler on the solar system. The 18th century saw more advances, including Bernoulli's theory of gases, Ben Franklin's treatise on electricity, and James Watt's harnessing of steam in a revolutionary new engine. The 19th century brought us Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, Pasteur's work on bacteria, and Darwin's theory of evolution, which remains a source of vigorous debate to this very day. Now, the 21st century, filled with promise and some say peril. What's next? Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Uh, John Maddox, uh, you have said in your very interesting book that there is a clear distinction between modern science and its precursors. What is that, uh, how does that work? I think what I meant by that is simply that in the old days, people like the Greeks, for example, took the view that any explanation of a phenomenon would suit. Uh, they didn't check it out against observation and experiment. And the startling new thing about modern science, which began about 500 years ago with Copernicus, the Polish astronomer who put the sun at the center of the universe, not the earth, he was anxious to make sure that his explanation fitted observation. And that's been the tendency ever since. Now, experiment has become a kind of tyrant for every scientist. The 20th century, which we tend to see as the most remarkable century uh, ever. So far. So far. But, but there, in, in earlier times, uh, I mean, 19th century, 18th century, 17th century, we had some pretty big guys around, didn't we? I mean, this is not a scientific method that John is talking about is, is, is not new in terms of this century. No, but it's new in terms of the last, I think John would say, 500 years. Uh, certainly we can look back to giants uh, such as Newton, uh, Galileo, Darwin, people who have uh, used their minds as well as their observational powers to propose models. And I think models and theories are very characteristic too of modern science. That is, flights of fancy grounded in observation are the two uh, prongs if you will, of, of, the, uh, of the probe that we use to, to understand the universe. And that's, that's what distinguishes modern science, I think, and 17th century science from what went before. Much of modern science has focused on two important subjects, where we came from and where we can go in the future. The first is a major argument that began in the 19th century and continues in the 20th. Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. 
Richard Dawkins is a distinguished British biologist. Life had been going on this planet for 3,000 million years uh, without any animals knowing why they were there until the truth finally dawned upon Homo sapiens. It just happened to be Charles Darwin, it could have been somebody else. Uh, our species is unique. We are all members of a unique species which is privileged to understand for the first time in that 3,000 million year history why we are here. But does Darwin's theory of natural selection mean there is no room for God in today's science? An emerging segment of scientists say no, arguing, for example, that cell formation and the development of advanced organs are far too complex to have occurred by chance or by evolution. That debate will continue on into the 21st century. We asked our panel to comment. I think we need to find out how life began on the surface of the Earth. It seems to me to be ridiculous to be looking for the origins of life uh, or life on other planets, as a great many people are, without knowing exactly how it began on the surface of the Earth, uh, which it did about four billion years ago. Four but Charles, one of the ways one can find out how life began here might be by looking at other uh, places in the solar system, such as Europa, the moon of Jupiter, that has, may have a, a nor, a, a, an ocean covering a volcanic, uh, volcanically active ocean ridge. And if life began there on this ridge, couldn't it have also begin, begun on the Earth? Yes, in the same uh, way? Uh, that's absolutely true, and it would be marvelous luck. If, if the next uh, space probe to go to Europa does actually find some evidence of life. My, my point is that um, it's actually very hard to know what you take as proof that something is living. One might say um, on the, on the, of the Earth, for example, that plainly the oxygen in the atmosphere is a sign that we're, uh, we, we have life on the surface of the Earth. But uh, oxygen appeared in the Earth's atmosphere relatively late. And um, ab uh, in fact, uh, about 1.3 billion years after the first time when life could have appeared on the surface of the Earth. And um, it appeared because there were living things. Let, let, let's, uh, so let's posit that uh, sometime in the 21st century, we learn with some specificity how life began. That's your, your point. Uh, okay, I'm sitting here and I say, so what? We've learned it. Does that, does that help us the way electricity helped us, the way biogenetics helped us? I mean, it, it's, a, it's obviously interesting, it's mysterious, uh, people have wondered about it. Therefore, what? Well, uh, the practical applications will not be immediate. Uh, it seems to me it's a sufficient justification for doing the work for finding out that once we know exactly how we began, we shall actually be in a stronger position to look at the world around us and to say, now we understand where we came from, we can the better manage our environment to preserve this rather delicate, but in my opinion, quite probable uh, arrangement of chemicals that constitutes the human being. Um, or life in general. But Ben, you know, your question, it seems to me, presupposes a kind of... Uh, Philistinism. <laughs> Philistinism. It's, right. it's, it's, it's the way people seem to talk about science. A recent review of John's book said that the biggest contribution of physicists these days is in uh, formulating derivatives for Goldman Sachs. Right. They make much more, uh, they have much more effect than they do in, in particle physics. Um, it seems to me, for example, that the implications of quantum mechanics, a horrible, uh, complicated, abstruse field, have not even begun to be realized. And yet we use quantum mechanics every day. We use lasers to, uh, to read uh, optical disks. Uh, now there may be atom lasers and molecular lasers that we have no idea what, uh, what their properties are. I, I, I want to and read... Every computer chip is based on quantum mechanics anyway. Okay. Let me, let, let me read you something uh, that uh, your countryman uh, Tom Stoppard wrote. 
Uh, the idea of God is slightly more plausible than the alternative proposition that, given enough time, some green slime could write Shakespeare's sonnet. Sonnets. So uh, th th there is a growing argument now that, I mean, you said when life began. That's classically a, a religious as well as a scientific question. Oh, indeed, I, I, yes, the, indeed. A theological yes. question. It seems to me the, the balance is beginning to turn that instead of people saying that science destroyed religion, they are now saying that science proves religion, that the, that the combination of factors that would make life uh, are so complicated, so delicately balanced, that it's a one in a super trillion shot that it could happen without an unmoved mover, without a creative source, without a god. Well, uh, uh, my view is diametrically opposite to that. Um, I, I know that there are people go, who go around saying science is now proving that God exists. Uh, my own opinion is that there's nothing in science that can prove that God exists or that God does not exist. Uh, but as to the origin of life, uh, the, uh, you're quite right. The, the chances that a complicated molecule like a DNA molecule or a complicated structure like the eye, the chances that would be produced by the random processes is negligible. By, by Darwinian but, processes. Yeah, yes. but, uh, but the, the point is that uh, these are not random processes. Uh, you, you have a lot of chemicals in some primeval sea. You have sunlight coming in. The sunlight will in induce some of those chemicals to make, to join together in perhaps long chains to make um, polymers. Uh, polymers is a class of chemicals which have long molecules in them, the plastics we use in everyday life for those. And I believe that there's enough evidence now for the formation of complicated molecules by the influence of sunlight to suggest that this is how life began in an orderly fashion um, and really in a quite predictable fashion. But, but the point is that if the slime and the, the stew that is being acted upon by the sunlight were not created in a most specific and precise uh, uh, set of circumstances that that sunlight acting on that slime, on that soup, would not, could not have produced what we, what but we then, have. There yeah. might be as lots Stoppard of different... Stoppard says Shakespeare's sonnets. I mean, you're, you've got to have a... You're being devil's advocate. <laughs> Peter, I'm sorry to... No, I, I, maybe I'm religious. Well, one of, the, mean, one of the ways around that might be that there are millions and millions of different ways that life might have begun, and we are only one of them. That is, that the slime could have nucleated in some other way than it did, but in fact, it was inevitable that it would nucleate in some way, and that some form of life might have grown out of that. That's a possibility. But I think, you know, br more broadly, the, the scientific uh, image is a, is a bottom-up kind of account of the world, whereas a, a philosophical god is a, is a more or less top-down uh, part of the view of the world. And people who make movies or, or, or look at scientists, want to make scientists into the top down, but they're not. And so I, my question f for John is, do you think that the image of the scientist is ever going to change from this godlike, all-powerful creature that's going to either wreck, or, or wreck our lives or, or bring us uh, heaven on earth? I think that's up to the scientific profession. I, would agree with what your question implies, that scientists in the past, and indeed in the present, have not been tactful in the way in which they present their view of what the world is like. You can see that most clearly now in genetics, where uh, scientists are forever announcing that they found the gene for haemophilia, the gene for this, the gene for that, thereby giving us all the impression that they believe that uh, human beings are simply the product of their genes. I don't believe that's the case. And uh, a few years down the road, when genetics has gone further, we will uh, have the same scientists saying, goodness, isn't this strange? We've found that the genes we all carry in our bodies also interact with the environment. The environment has a strong effect on them. 
in the, uh, the normal development of a person, uh, the external environment in which the development takes place, the mother's uterus, the learning experience in early childhood, which is an important part of the environment, does actually help to fashion the brain uh, and therefore the human personality in ways that uh, and are now too subtle for the people sorting out the genes in the laboratory to, to catalogue. And uh, it's my belief that just a few years down the road, the same people who are now cataloguing the human genome will be saying, we're astonished. Um, uh, the external environment is also affecting the way these genes work. The 20th century has created a new scientific laboratory, space, where we put a man on the moon in 1969. The eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The space shuttle allows scientists to tinker with our floating satellites. And in 1997, remote control vehicles explore the surface of Mars. We, we have had a now a 77-year-old astronaut circling the world, uh, Senator Glenn. Um, it, are, are we, do we get anything, again, returning to my Philistine practical notion here, are we going to get anything out of space travel? We're going to get a lot of information by sending robotic spacecraft to the planets. Yeah, but I, I know we'll get information, but if, if we find out the composition of Mars, uh, the atmosphere of Mars, uh, I, I, is that going to help me? Is it going to help my children li live longer lives? Are they going to be healthier? Are they going to be happier? Is it going to be more convenient? Do we get something out of it other than what they used to say we got tang orange juice out of uh, the space shot or something? I think we need to understand how the solar system was formed in the first place. And that may have a practical uh, value. Um, we don't really know what's at the center of the Earth, for example. It seems to be molten iron, but there are all kinds of funny things about it. For example, the blob of molten iron at the center of the Earth is spinning faster than the Earth itself. Why should that be? Nobody knows. Uh, that may affect the way in which uh, magnetic forces on the surface of the Earth change in the course of time in a radical way. But more than that, if we don't understand the solar system, we have no easy way of telling what debris in the form of asteroids and meteorites is uh, swanning around. And there have been many occasions in the past when the Earth has been hit by asteroids with damaging effect. It killed off the dinosaurs, for example, 64 million years ago. So uh, we do have a practical need to okay. find out what's in the solar system. I, I, I want to I, I ask a question. Is, is there a particular air of great excitement now in the scientific community? I would say or? categorically there's enormous excitement. The origin of life is a very open question right now, precisely because there's, there's such a constellation of different sciences looking at the possibility of having both um, an observational and an experimental window on that question. We've been finding planets around other stars. We've learned from the Martian meteorite that rocks can move from planet to planet. We now know that there are but certain... That hasn't been established yet, has it? That's Absolutely, still... it was established. Uh, Not that it was living, but oh, that there was okay. a rock that oh, got from Mars to I, the Earth. Are you still excited about science? I, I think it's the most rewarding intellectual activity there is. And everything that's happened this century has made it seem more rewarding. We don't know how the universe is built. We don't know how it began. We don't know uh, for sure uh, what are the constituents of matter. We do know that um, there's been a tremendous difficulty, which is a huge impediment in the physical sciences, to reconcile quantum mechanics, which Peter referred to, and Einstein's theory of gravitation, which 
or the general theory of relativity, which he published in 1915. And until that problem is solved, a great deal about the origin of the universe, the Big Bang and all that, will remain obscure. We, we, we're running out of time now. The, 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 let me just perform a, uh, an experiment in, in uh, time transport into the future. Let, let us stipulate that it is the year 2050, uh, and we're having this kind of discussion. What would you guess that we have learned in the first 50 years of the 21st century? I think we shall have the Human Genome Project completed and we'll discover that it takes an army of people to find out exactly what the, those genes are doing in the normal human body. Uh, people will be stuck into that problem uh, hoping to find new medicines that way. I think that we shall know the details of the solar system quite well by then and we shall be uh, mounting programs to avoid the impact of asteroids on the Earth. I think we'll um, not be much forrader with the understanding of how the brain works because it's such a difficult problem, but I would hope the techniques will have got so much better that the practical, uh, experimental approach to how the brain works will have um, made progress. I believe that uh, 50 years from now there'll still be uncertainty about how the particles of matter are arranged, uh, how they're related to other things. I think we'll be in much the same situation as we are at present, except that medicine will have made enormous strides in the development of new drugs. Peter, um, just to get to stick on that topic 50 years from now, um, antibiotics, airplanes, telecommunications, automobiles, air conditioning, telephones, television, all that came about in this century. Uh, they're practical applications of theory. Are we going to have that sort of an explosion of new goods? I mean, automobiles transformed the world. Television transformed the world. Telephones, air conditioning. Are we going to have those sorts of inventions coming at us? We have now, we are in the midst of a revolution, which is the computer revolution. It's been going on since uh, uh, the Second World War, but the personal computer has been with us now since about 1980. Well, what's the product it's, going to be? The product is going to be, I think, new modes of receiving information. We've heard a lot about um, new modes of, of telegraphing movement. For example, cyber surgery is on the horizon. We can imagine that surgeons will do operations through, uh, through remote manipulation of instruments, much the way they do today with laparoscopic surgery. You can imagine that... Uh, A lot of the practical stuff, you, you mentioned it, does come out to medicine, though, in terms of what we're looking at in the, in the short term. I mean, the, the convenience That's what people are willing to pay for. Right. But there well, is, you, you speak about communications. Uh, the, the transmission of power is something that is just announced uh, almost as we speak through superconducting wires. This is estimated to save maybe six billion dollars in, in the, the first few years of operation just because you don't have the losses over the wire. How about the desalinization of water, are we, of salt water? Are we going to see that? That would be a monumental change in the human condition. It, it would be, and so would the use of, uh, of hydrogen fuel. If one were to split water, get the salt out, and also get the hydrogen out, you can burn hydrogen, you can transport hydrogen, and uh, when you burn hydrogen, that's combining it with oxygen, what do you get? Hydrogen plus oxygen, which is water. Are we going to see that by 2050? I think so. That's a political question, though, okay. primarily. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, John, Peter, thank you very much. And thank you for Think Tank. I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036 or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. 
and please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.